Good morning. Well, that was pretty weak. You knew better than that. Good morning. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? Amen. That's why we're here, here to worship him, and he showed up. Amen? It's good. Hallelujah. If you are and able, can stand. If you can stand, if you are able to stand, stand with me for the reading of the word today. Hallelujah. Amen. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will be rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Gerald, can you pray for me? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for our pastor. We ask, Lord, that you would bless him, that your words would be his words, his words would be your words, that you would use him and flow through him and speak to us and encourage the sheep, encourage this congregation today to be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Keep Pastor James and Jill in your prayers. They're in Florida right now doing a disabilities camp. He's the speaker, and uh, we all who speak love God's anointing to come upon us so that we say the right thing, so he would be asking for that right now. Uh, he'll be doing another camp at Camp Daniel. If you are a person that would like to work with any kind of uh, people with disabilities, see Pastor Tim after the service. Tim, can you stand up and do this with that beautiful orange, yellow, pink shirt you got on? There you go. Talk to him, and he can tell you how to get hooked up to help out at Camp Daniel. It's life-changing for many people. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been going through the book of Galatians. One in, in chapters 1 and 2, um, we heard about the gospel being preached, and we heard about the, the validation of Paul and how powerful that was and where he was trained up. And then in chapter 3, we learned from Pastor Tim as he took us through that message about justification by faith alone. A powerful statement, a faith statement. It's one that we should grab onto. And then last week, we concentrated on the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit in chapter 5. And in chapter 6, we'll see the very practical application of love with Christ's loves. But be reminded that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you, Jesus. It's been a crazy week, hasn't it? I mean, it has been a crazy week, hasn't it? Things that haven't happened in 50 years. Things that haven't happened in 50 years. I think there's some flowers and some locusts that don't show up for a period of time. But I believe that God showed up in the nick of time Amen. and did this pretty incredible work. I also realize through indoctrination, and this is going to be hard to hear, but I'm just going to tell you, through the indoctrination of a societal plague, our thinking has been altered. I'm talking about everybody in this room. It has been affected to one degree or another. I heard a preach, and I shared this with several people that I'm close to. I heard a preaching by Franklin Jensen. You all know Franklin Jensen? 
We do our fasting off of his book. And Sally and I are riding back from Door County. And uh, Franklin is preaching away. It was called Man Up. Ooh, you can't say that. You can't say man up. Why, Sally, he can't say that. He's not supposed to say that. And in my spirit, ugh, I was feeling this edginess. Why was I feeling this edginess? And then he went on to say some other things. That, oh, you can't say that. It's too offensive. And I'm uncomfortable in the car, and I'm listening to every word he said, and every word he said was spot on accurate. I left that car that day so filled with testosterone. I was such a man leaving that car because I was a mouse as I was here and sitting in the midst of that message. And I'm saying, why is this bothering me when the truth of it is so real? Why is it bothering me? It was bothering me because the truth of God's word was being spoken. And I was wrestling with my flesh who has been marinating in a world system that has tainted me to some degree. Now, if this happens to me, I'm thinking it's got to happen to you. Two. And there was a lesson in it. And I think at some degree that's exactly what's happening to the church. Even this awesome week where God moved in our country. He changed something that I believe came from the pit of hell that we would not value life. And he made a statement and God's making statements through his word all the time, but he made a move that went along his statement and caused the stand to take place. Is it uncomfortable for some? I'm going to say it's uncomfortable for most of the people in this room. Is it glorious? It's incredibly glorious. Amen. So like you can hear the people going, amen, real loud. They don't have a problem. They, they're, they're fine. But for us who have been marinating in the world, I think it was a shocker and was good for us. And I just want to share a few things with you. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, he's speaking to Thomas. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I broke it down. Jesus is the way. Well, I kind of have my way. Your way is the wrong way if it's not Jesus' way. He says that he is the only way to the Father. There is no other way. So do not deceive yourselves thinking that there's another way. I can be good enough. No, you can't. I can be smart enough. No, you aren't. I can do great works for God. No, you can't. Not apart from him. He said, he is the vine. You're the branch. He that abides in me will bear much fruit. Good stuff. But apart from me, he says, you can do nothing apart from God. Okay. He alone is the way to the Father. He is the way to heaven. There is no other way. Actually, there's no other way to the Father. There is another way. The Bible says that there's two roads. There's a wide road and a narrow road. The wide road, many take and it leads to destruction. The narrow road, few take it, and it leads to everlasting life. Let this be a sign to us about the two roads. And I believe in some way we're going to be faced with that crossroad, and we're going to have to make a decision which way we're going to go. It's not a coasting ride. It's a road, and it's a road that must be walked. So this, that was for free. I didn't even know that was coming out of me. Second thing, Jesus is the way is the first thing. The second thing, it says Jesus is the truth. Not your truth, not my truth, which is popular phraseology for today. Well, that's my truth, and I'm sticking to it. You're a knucklehead. That's your truth. What does your truth line up with? What is the origin of your truth? Well, I, got, I read a book. Did you read the book? No, 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 no. I read a book. And that's where your truth came from. Well, I got a friend really smart friend, and he told me, and that's where my truth came in. And I got some parents that they gave me some truth. That's not truth. Unless it originates in Christ, it's not truth. If it does not come from the word of God, it is not truth. 
Now, if it comes from that place and that's where the origins of this truth are, praise God. You know the truth. And the Bible says when you do, it will set you free. If you cling to it and grab onto it. Set you free from what? From the judgment that is to come because we haven't walked in the truth. We haven't believed in the truth. Jesus says, I am truth. The words I speak to you, they are truth. And the next one is, Jesus is life. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. This, this scripture is so incredibly powerful because it establishes who Jesus was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you know that to be true? Yes, so let's go back to the beginning in Genesis. And I'll probably mess this up. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Who was there? The Bible said that the Spirit hovered over the waters. The Holy Spirit was there. And the Father was there because he is the, cre he is the origin of the creation. And how did he create, pray tell? He spoke, and it was. He spoke the word. He spoke the living word. I would say he spoke Christ, and it was. Amen. That is our beginning, and that is the foundation of our faith. And then it goes down a little further. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. This is so powerful in today's day because... The truth that you speak that's rooted in the origins of the Bible, the book, Christ, they can't comprehend. They don't get it unless the Spirit of God is touching their heart and their mind and making them able to receive it. And the Bible says that that wisdom that I'm speaking to you about is foolishness in the world today. So even in my own capabilities, I cannot receive Christ unless the Spirit of God is at work in me. It's foolishness to me. It's nonsense to me. I can't receive it. And so what does that do to me? Sometimes it, it, it see, there's a void in us that says that I have a need for, for God. And so I pursue that need, but without the Spirit of God helping me, I can't get it, and I pursue the wrong things that are to become God. What are those wrong things? First off, it's self. I'm my own God. No, I'm not. That's delusional. Wisdom is God. No, it's not. God has wisdom. God is the creator of wisdom. But it in itself is not God. The really, really smart people? No. The really, really philosophical people? No, they're not God. He alone is God. Why am I laying this foundation? Because like me, many of you struggled just to hear something that was, and by the way, I am so happy, but I struggled with what are people going to say? What are people going to do? What are they going to feel? And I'm going through all this nonsense, and why? Because I've been marinating in a cesspool of thinking. You know what the good news is? I've also been marinating in this church since about 1984 or 5. Yeah. And I knew nothing except that there was a God. And I thought I knew him and I didn't know him. I found him here by an old man preaching one scripture after another, one scripture after another. My head's going like this. How does he keep up with it? Oh, I got that one. And I get saved. Yeah. 
I make a decision to follow Christ. I'm crying like a school child because the Spirit of God came upon me. And I couldn't get the understanding until the Spirit of God came upon me. While I was a teacher in the Green Bay Public Schools, that was part of my indoctrinational process. And I said, I think I'm supposed to do something in the church. I'm pretty, I, I, like I can connect kind of well with teenagers. Maybe I'll go talk to that youth pastor over there. So I went and talked to Pastor Jerry. And pa Pastor Jerry looked at me like, yeah, I've heard this before. This guy will be here three days and that'll be it. You want to help? Go do this or go do that. And he gave me some chores to do and I did them. And I sat in for the next, I don't know how many years, 15 years probably, 10, 15 years. I'm sitting there as a youth advisor uh, helping Pastor Jerry run a youth group every Wednesday hearing the preaching of God's word. And it's interesting. The guy that was preaching one scripture after another was amazing and the church just loved him. Jerry was speaking to teenagers and that I could understand. He's speaking at the level I could get. So consequently, I start growing and growing and growing. I've come to the place where I can grow a lot on my own. Not because there's anything special in me. He taught me how to dig into God's word and learn the truth. And the beautiful thing about the word of God is the spirit of God is present when I'm in the word of God. And he begins to reveal to me truth. God put people in my lives. God put Peter and Teresa Falk into our lives. Didn't he, Sally? What'd they do? They were four and a half miles in front of us. And they would speak life to us. And they'd speak truth to us. Thank God for people like Peter and Teresa who spoke truth to us. Uh, there was a woman's event here yesterday. Soup to salad. Leftovers are just useless. It's salad, really. It's salad. No drumsticks, no, you know, nothing. Sally and Elizabeth came home, and they were so excited about the people that were there. And Elizabeth began to share with me, and Sally began to share with me the people that spoke in, in into their lives. And I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm like a school child again. I'm getting emotional as they're telling me about it. This person, that, this person, Jeannie did this, and Janice did this, and all of a sudden these names come flooding at me. And wow, what, what, what was so beautiful about it is the church had stepped up and they had an impact on my family. And I know I'm, I'm going in some wild, crazy places, but I want to lay the foundation of faith in the church because it's being challenged this very day. I want you to just right where you are. Don't raise your hand, please. There'll be a sniper in here, I'm sure. In your heart, ask yourself a question. Were you uncomfortable when you heard the decision that Roe versus Wade was overturned? That's for you. Oh, no, no, no. You just had to speak up. No, that's an internal question. Did it feel weird? Did it feel like, oh, boy, what's up? And I'm saying, at some level, it did in me. And thank God for the foundation that he's laid in me that I could come around and get back to clear thinking. And then there's some, and I'm just going to say this, you took the opposition approach. The world is going this way, I'm going this way, and I'm sticking to it. And you dig your heels in, but there's no foundation behind your belief. That's no good either. That's where people march on a capital in pure rage and anger. They're, they're not thinking godly. God doesn't tell us to do work like that. And if he does, it's very clear. John 1.14, it's one of my favorite verses. It says, and the word that was spoken at creation, the word that breathed breath into Adam, the breath of life into Adam, that word became flesh and dwelt among us, it says. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth full of grace and full of truth. I, said, I love to visit with Tim Mandich, Jerry Bruett, Ralph Luciano, Jim Campa, Joe Seiler. I love to visit with these guys because they all know the word, they love the word, and they feed, on e they feed the word into each other, if that makes sense. That language, don't, don't correct it. Diag don't diagram what I just said. Just think about what I said. 
because they're in the word and they speak life to you. And we get to talk about the word of God and it's so, it's so encouraging. And the challenge is, and we're going to talk about this in verse 8, he says, for he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And when I'm talking to these brothers about the word of God, the word became flesh, the word is Christ himself. The way, the truth, and the life, it brings life to me. You see, that's what Jesus is all about. He is about life and life to the full, abundant life. But it's eternal life. And it's not life apart, it's life with him. So the issue of life is a big deal. And I'm, everything within me has brought me to a place of celebration. I got past the indoctrination, and I moved into the celebration, and it's been wonderful. But he's full of grace and truth. You don't win the war. You don't win the spiritual war with a stinking foghorn blowhorn. That's not how the world, that's not how it's won. It's won by grace and it's won by the truth of God's word. It's won by operating in the spirit of God to speak life to people because that's the business that Jesus is in. He is in the business of life. And life to the full. His desire, according to the word of God, is that not one would perish. Every person in this room, whether you're left, whether you're right, his desire is that you would come to know him and have everlasting life because that's who he is. He is life. And at this moment, Jesus himself is at the right hand of the Father praying for you and praying for me that we would come to know the fullness of who he is, that we would fully surrender ourselves, one of those small G gods that we've made us, surrender ourselves unto him for that everlasting life. That's his business. That's what he does. You all know we have an enemy of our soul, don't you? Not supposed to talk about the devil in church. In fact, I would say today most pastors across the land are not talking about the devil in church. But if you were to break down the word of God, he's probably the, the, one of the most talked about things and, and his domain, hell, is one of the most talked about places in the whole scripture. Why? Because it's real. It is real. There is the Holy Spirit, which is the third part of the Holy Trinity, but there are demonic spirits, and they're after your soul like God is after your soul. But God is for everlasting life. There's is for eternal destruction. Do not be deceived. That's the message for the church. Do not be deceived. Yes, we've been marinating in a world system that is off. He said it would be off. It's not our system. He said, I'm from another kingdom. This is what they do. We don't do this. We do this. And we have to get that at, at the deeper level. We have to get that at the deeper level. But he who sows to the spirit will, will of the spirit reap everlasting life. That's my prayer for this church, is that we sow to the spirit, that you would all have everlasting life. Is that good? We Okay. Okay, can we talk about Jesus now? All right. Galatians 6 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken, a man, a woman, a believer is overtaken and fallen into sin of some sort, I'm going to tell you how God works. Fallen into any trespass, you who are spiritual, that's the church, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you be tempted. So somebody is struggling with sin. It's a brother or sister in Christ. We are to step in and help them. And once again, we don't do it with a foghorn or a blowhorn. We do it with love and we do it with grace. I'm going to just share a few things. Able Church, I hope somebody, some people here decide to help out for a week up at Camp Daniel. 
because they teach, I think Able Church teaches us how to love. And the only purpose is to love. How to love with the purpose of loving. And there's no conditions, at, no conditions attached. And when you go to Camp Daniel, what Camp Daniel does is they, or Able Church on Friday night, what, what, what they do is they reach out and they demonstrate love and they show love and they don't judge. It's one of the most beautiful lessons I've learned in the last 13, 14, 17 years, whatever it is here in this church, is how to, I judge less because I've been taught how to judge less. Able Church has been a big part of that and I'm not talking Able Church on Friday nights. I'm talking about Able Church here in this church as I meet with different people at different times and they come up to me. They teach me how to love and never judge. We're called to do that. We're spiritual. We who are spiritual are to help people who have stumbled. Do we do that? That's a question. That don't answer this one out loud either. We'll have to have a whole repentance thing going on up here. But do we do that? Or do we judge? We go to the place of judging. Oh, look, pity the fool. Look what he did. Look what she did. No, we don't do that. We shouldn't do that. Do we? Probably at some degree we might. We judge. God, forgive me for when I've judged. God, forgive us for when we've judged. No. Love. Focused love. Agape love is what he's called us to. That's what brothers and sisters are supposed to do. But we're in a day, and it's a tricky day. Hebrews 4.12 tells us how tricky this day is. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful. We love the word of God here. We're studying it in D groups and, and life groups and Sunday, and people are in studies. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints of the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what God does with his word. As we get into the word, he looks internally and cuts to all the places it needs to cut, and he separates and he divides. What's happening in the church today is there's separation and there's division, and it's not meant to be. It wasn't the way it was supposed to be. The division is personal. We're supposed to Cut out the, the, the crud in our lives. And God does that by his word. And he's like a good doctor. He anesthetizes you. I can't even say the word, but you know what I mean. He does that to you so that you can receive it. Because you're a believer. Remember, to the unbeliever, it's a stumbling block. But there is a division going on in the church. You all know it. You've seen it. You've felt it. And it's not just Living Hope Church. It's the church. And it's the church that the gospel is preached. The spirit of God is allowed to move. The worship is pure and, and spirit-filled. And we in the congregation get lost in it. That's the church. And this is the church that's supposed to not be divided. We're supposed to be united. Every prayer that Jesus has on our behalf as he sits at the right hand of the Father, is that we would love each other like him and the Father love each other. That's what the church is called to. Hold it, wait a minute. That was before this happened and before that happened and before these things happened. You know, um, these people are off. They're a little bit far right. They want to carry a gun. Or they're way far left. No. Church is supposed to come together. Are we different? Heck yes. None of you are like me. Thank goodness for you. We're different and it's okay. Where's our foundation though? That should be the same. And we discuss things and we work things out. But there is a, a spirit at work against the church. And God allows it. Why? Because God will not be mocked with pretenders. The weak fall off. The weak thinking about that, that road that leads to everlasting life, the narrow one, and there's no, eh, it's too steep. Ah, this is where everybody's going. No, 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 don't take that road. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. 
What does the Spirit do? It justifies us. When we come to Christ, we're justified. What happens when we learn about Christ? We're sanctified. What happens when we die and we go to heaven? Because life is eternal. We have eternal life. We are glorified in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Second thing that we're called, we are called to bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens and so be and so fulfill the law of Christ. How do we do this? We love. We bear the burdens in love. We help in love. This, is, this church is incredible at helping. When COVID was going on, we had people helping in the back, giving people showers and giving them meals and giving them food. We help people every Thursday with, their, with the issues that this world throws at us, helping them navigate those things in love and no judgment. It's beautiful. We come together in life groups, and life groups to me has been one of the most productive ways of ministering to one another in all areas, in all areas. People helping people with loss, people helping people with children that are struggling, people helping with people with, and why are they doing it? Because they have a relationship with one another. We got away from the division. We got into some unity, and when, when we're gathered together, together in this way, he's with us. And that's the call. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Thank you, Jesus. I spoke the other week about John, uh, from the book of John, and I, I spoke just a little bit about Peter and how he let his Savior down. He denied him when Jesus needed him most. And we come to John 21, and Jesus restores him. And he restores him with the fullness of the idea of love. Brotherly love. That should be happening. Agape love. That should be strived for. We can only do that with the help of God. And he's restoring and he's building them up. Why? Because he has great purpose. He has great purpose for us being united as a church. Thank you, Jesus, for how you view us. And then he gives us a caution in verse 3. It says, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Don't be deceived. Romans 12.3 says, for I say, through the grace given to me, everyone who is among you, not to think highly of themselves, more than he ought to think, but think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. We're not that big a deal. Individually. Don't think that you're such a big deal. Anything good in you came from God. Every good work you do came from him. That's the reality. Oh, wait a minute. I wasn't even in a church, and I helped a lady at the grocery store, or I helped a guy lift a heavy charcoal bag. Well, that was nice. You should be doing that stuff. Don't be looking for your trophy. Really, don't be. Jesus did it. Thank you. Verse 4 says, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Why? Why do we examine our own work? Because we're going to stand at a judgment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it tells us we will stand at the judgment, the Bema Seat judgment, where we are judged for our works. And there they will go and be tested through the fire, and we will find if they had any value or not. And what does that mean? That means was that work rooted in Christ or was that work rooted, try and say that three times, in your own good works? If it has any value, it's rooted in Christ and will be judged. So we examine ourselves. How do you do that? You take your eyes off the others. That's how you begin. You examine you and not them. So when I'm yelling about foghorns and blowhorns, I am talking about people from the church. Let God deal with the rest. We deal with each other. We deal with self. And then he gives us a plan for within the church. There's a discipline plan that he gives us. And we've had to use this in the church several times. And I think I threw that page out. Yeah, I threw that page out because I really didn't want to talk about it. But there's a process. You have an issue with somebody, take the issue to that person. 
If it's not resolved, take it to two or three others. If it's not resolved, you bring it to your church board, your elder board. If it's not resolved, the guy's problem is greater than one that came with the problem. If it's not resolved, he may be asked to leave the church if he can't change. Or the other person would be asked. There's a process that God has for us examining ourselves in the body of believers. And it's a good thing. We examine us. You examine you, I'll examine me, but as brothers and sisters, we, we encourage one another. For each one shall bear his own Lord load. Wait a minute, I thought earlier it said that we're supposed to bear each other's loads. We are, but we have a load to carry too. I have to carry my own cross just like you have to carry your own cross. Take up your cross and follow me, Jesus said. Paul takes it a little further and says, I'm crucified with Christ. <laughs> Therefore, I no longer live. Take up your cross. Take up the things you're called to take up. And then we help others with their burdens as well. We have a whole ministry in this church. Pastor Donnie, you're, you're amazing. What you do is amazing. The way you help people. He helps people that are burdened beyond what they can bear. There's other people in here. I, I've watched for years men in this church that I know that go help somebody with issues or problems because they can't handle it all by themselves. And the women, they take it just to another level of reaching out to the lost or the, the, the hurting woman, women in the church. And they help them carry the burden. Last week I talked about, and here's what it looks like. I talked about a, a little girl that was killed. Many in this church know this family. And I got emotional as I'm sharing. What was I doing? I was carrying the burden, the emotional and spiritual burden as well. I don't even know the people, but I'm carrying the burden. I grieved with them. That's happening in life groups all the time. We grieve with people who lose somebody. We, we carry the burden with them. We're supposed to do that, but then we have to carry our own burden. And usually that means going to the cross, laying our stuff down at the cross and giving it over to God because we cannot bear our burden. We do that in love and grace for people outside the church. You will have great effect Great effect. People come to Christ when we shine like Christ. When we work like Christ works and people are carrying heavy loads, do you know what people outside the building are carrying in real life? They put on a shine, but if you look past the shine, you see the hurt and you see the pain, and we help them carry the burden, and their lives are transformed and changed. Then it says, this is my favorite part. Share in all good things with him who teaches. That was my favorite part, and I'm just kidding with you, and you're not in a laughing mood. I can see that right now. And it says in verse 6, Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. So, Jerry, for 17 years, plus and beyond, you have taught me the word. Want to go out for lunch after we're done here? We get a little bite to eat? I'd like to say thank you. Jeannie, you're every bit a part of that, speaking into our lives as, we, as you have. But that's not just you two. There's so many more. Did you ever have a discussion with Mike Wil uh, Waldrop? Have a discussion with him one time. See where it'll take you. His understanding of the word is outstanding. Did you ever talk scripture with him? What's he doing? He, he's He's teaching where you go to Smoky Bones or some place where they cook meat. <laughs> I should be thanking him for it. Peter Falk had a heart attack. I'm driving him to the hospital while he's having a heart attack, and what's he doing? He's teaching from 1 Timothy. What's 1 Timothy all about? It was about the young believer. Oh, I get it. He had a heart attack so he could teach me a lesson. The reality is Peter is pouring into me because him and Teresa pour into us. Thank you, Jesus. That's what we're to do. And we're supposed to be grateful and thankful for those who pour into you. In Malachi, it says we're to give a tenth. And then it says, after you give a tenth, and that's to the church, for the work of the church. 
God challenges us in this thing because it is such a difficult thing to do. We're takers, not givers, typically. And see if I don't open the storehouses of heaven and pour blessings upon you that you can't imagine. Can you outgive God? We can't. Try it once. And then pay your teachers. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. We're, we're, we're going to quicken this up. Actually, Joe, if you can come on up here, that would be really good. Your team, whatever you're bringing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The last point I want to make is there's a sowing and reaping process. It's a spiritual process. It doesn't make sense to somebody who doesn't know Christ. To non-believers, this sowing and reaping doesn't make sense. It does to a farmer at a level, but spiritually speaking, it says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. It's the scripture I read earlier. What are you sowing into? What are you pouring into? Monday nights, there's people that pour into prayer. They're sowing into prayer. How are they going to reap? They're going to reap in answers. How cool is that? You sow into prayer, you reap in answers. You reap in understanding. You reap in intimacy and closeness with God. You got people on Thursday nights, they're sowing into people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. What are they reaping? They're reaping healthy people, learning how to cope and deal with the toughness of this world, who will then in turn speak into them when they need it. It's a small picture of the church. There's a sowing. We plant into something, and we reap a harvest. And the very simple one is the tithing thing. You can't outgive God. You pour into God. He pours back so many fold over, you can't understand it. But what are you pouring into? Sow into your job. I get that. For the workaholic in here, you're sowing into your job. What are you reaping? Anxiety, stress, discord, not connecting with your parents, your wife, your children. I don't know. What are you sowing into? Are you sowing into your children? Sowing into your children. How about us older ones? Are we sowing into our grandchildren? Are we speaking life into our grandkids? What are you harvesting? You're harvesting souls. You're impacting lives for eternity. Maxine, thank you for sowing into my family. I don't know what God's going to give you, but it's going to be awesome because God give her something awesome because she's been amazing to our family. What are you sowing into? This is what Paul is telling the Galatians. And then he tells us, let us not grow weary in doing good. Remember, every good and perfect gift is from God. Every good and perfect work is God working through you. As we do his work, let us not grow weary. When the church is struggling in division, let us not grow tired. Let us stay in the battle. Let us stay in grace. Let us stay in love. Let us stay in reaching out as Christ would reach out. Stay in the business of God. Sow into that business. And watch harvest the harvest of souls. We won't even see the harvest, really, until we're up in glory. And we see what God had done through us. And what a celebration that will be for you and for me. And then he says this again, and this is what I want you to leave with. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are in the household of faith. Do not be quarreling and fighting with the brothers and sisters in Christ, but instead be encouraging, training when necessary, speaking life to the brothers and sisters in Christ. That is what we're called to do. We don't need a feeble church. We want a strong church, strong enough to do the things God has called us to do. And we can only do that if we're doing this as the body of Christ, not random Rambos out there. No, we do it as a body of believers coming together, doing the work that God has called us to do. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Right now, I just pray for each person here in this room that you have an encounter with God this week that is so clear to you, that it is God speaking to you, that you hear him so thoroughly and completely, that you step where he wants you to step, that you open up and give to what he wants you to give, that you surrender where you're supposed to surrender, and that he pours love into you that you've never experienced before, this kind of love. I pray that he gives you the fullness of his love. I pray that for each person in here in Jesus' name. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, who sits at the right hand of the Father praying for you right now, if you don't know him, I pray that you see him tonight before your head hits the pillow and you call out to him and say, Jesus, I want you. Here's my sin. I want your salvation. I want your lordship. And I want to give you my surrender. I pray that for each person that doesn't know him and the blessings to come that each who do, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.